Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to talk about the atom. So the atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the characteristics of that element. So for instance, if we had a sheet of aluminum foil, it's just made of pure aluminum. And if we were able to zoom in on the smallest part of aluminum, we would see the atom. Now, another way to think of this is if you took a piece of aluminum and tried to rip it up into tinier and tinier pieces, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to get to uh, the smallest part of an element. But theoretically, if you could keep ripping up that aluminum over and over and over again, you would eventually get to the smallest piece of that element. So for instance, one of these spheres right here is an atom of aluminum. So the idea of an atom has been around for a very long time. Um, philosophers, even in Greece, um, they termed uh, atomos, which stood for atoms. Um, and they had this idea that there was just the smallest piece of an element or of matter. Now, other philosophers at the time disagreed with that. They thought everything was made up of uh, wind or fire or water, etc. Um, but the original philosophers turned out to be right. Now, later on in the 1800s, uh, scientist Dalton, John Dalton, he came up with uh, the atomic theory, which kind of summarized everything we knew about atoms up to that point. So according to Dalton's atomic theory, atoms are tiny particles of matter. Atoms of an element are similar to each other. And they're also different from those of other elements. So if you have an atom of carbon versus an atom of aluminum, they're going to be very different from each other. Now, atoms of two or more different elements can combine to form compounds. So one example is water, H2O. So we've got atoms of hydrogen combining with an atom of oxygen. And atoms can also rearrange to form new combinations in a chemical reaction. So for instance, iron can react with oxygen to form rust. So we've seen that example before. Now, one thing to keep in mind, atoms are never created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. So if we have four atoms in the beginning of our reaction, we'll have those four atoms at the end of the reaction. They might be in a different combination or in a new form, but we still retain those four specific atoms. Okay. So electrical charges in an atom now, if we were able to zoom in on a single atom, we would find that it contains what are called subatomic particles. So uh, if we just drew kind of like a, a circle and that's our atom, there would be subatomic particles in the middle and then some kind of floating around the edges. Now, um, protons, one of the subatomic particles, those have a positive charge. And we'll talk about where they're located in the atom in a second. Electrons, another subatomic particle, those have a negative charge. And then there's also neutrons. Neutrons have no charge, so they're neutral. Now, one thing to consider here, like charges repel each other and unlike charges attract. So let's say we have two protons that are near each other. So these are, oh, 
These are our protons. And again, they have positive charge. They're going to naturally repel each other. Same with electrons, they're negatively charged. Electrons will also repel each other. However, opposites attract. So if we had a proton and an electron near each other, then those are going to attract. Okay, so how did scientists figure out that we even have subatomic particles in an atom? So a scientist named J.J. Thompson, he performed an experiment uh, using what are called cathode ray tubes. And those are shown below. So down below, that's a cathode ray tube. And what he did was he passed a uh, beam through this tube. And this tube has a negative end called the cathode and then a positive end called the anode. Now the particles, this ray of particles that he passed through this tube, they were attracted to the positive end of the tube. So J.J. Thompson concluded those must be negatively charged because we know opposite charges attract. So eventually he was able to figure out that those negative particles are electrons. And also electrons have a really, really tiny mass. So electrons have a much smaller mass than the atom and they're negatively charged. So from this, Thompson proposed something called a plum pudding model of the atom. And he thought that protons and electrons were randomly distributed in a positively charged cloud. Now, uh, if you have heard of cathode rays before, it might be from cathode ray televisions. So if you grew up with uh, one of these TVs here, um, you might have noticed that the back of the TV was quite large. So in the back of the TV is actually a cathode ray tube and if we kind of look up here at this diagram, the cathode ray tube is in the back and it emits a beam of particles or electrons. And you can also bend the direction that the particles are traveling in um, using coils of copper. So kind of the magnetism there. And then those electrons are going to hit the back of the TV screen and on the back of the TV screen are something called phosphors, which have different colors. So what ends up happening is the electrons will kind of start up here and then they'll scan back and forth all the way down the screen until a picture is formed. So um, I know I had one of these TVs growing up and sometimes I would notice like a little wiggle in the screen that would kind of travel down. And that was probably because things were out of sync or something was broken in the back of the TV. Um, but anyway, if you ever have a chance to open up one of those TVs, you know, be careful, but that's what's back there is a cathode ray tube. All right, so here's the uh, plum pudding model that J.J. Thompson proposed. So he thought that there was this kind of positive pudding-like substance, and then negative electrons were just floating around in this substance. So the reason he called it the plum pudding model is it definitely resembles plum pudding. So this is a plum pudding, and these are the plums kind of scattered throughout. And so that's what he was kind of picturing for an atom. Now, J.J. Uh, Thompson, one of his students uh, named Rutherford, was trying to prove that the plum pudding model was correct. So he thought, okay, I'm going to set up an experiment 
where I shoot particles at a thin piece of gold foil. So he set up a little piece of foil and he shot particles at it. And his thought was, okay, if the plum pudding model is correct, then all of the particles should just pass right through each other. Because if we go back, there's nothing really dense within this model. Everything's just kind of freely floating around this, this pudding. So the thought was that if we had two atoms with this type of pudding, they would just pass right through each other. So um, in Rutherford's gold foil experiment, positively charged particles were aimed at gold, a thin piece of gold. And those positively charged particles mostly did pass straight through, but some of the particles bounced off and were deflected. So because some of the particles bounced back or even kind of bounced off of the gold foil, Rutherford concluded that there must be a really small, dense, positively charged nucleus in the atom. So his model had a really small, dense nucleus right in the center. And the idea was if that came into contact with another nucleus, they would just bounce right off of each other. So this is a better picture of the experiment that Rutherford conducted. So he started with a source of positively charged particles and he shot those through that thin gold foil or at the thin gold foil. And then he surrounded the foil with a detector. So every time a particle bounced off or passed through, it was detected and recorded. So again, he noticed that some particles did pass right through the foil, but then he also noticed that some were deflected back towards the original source. So he came up with the idea that actually the plum pudding model is false. And in fact, there is a positively charged nucleus right in the center of the atom. And when that nucleus hits another nucleus, they're so dense that they act like billiard balls, if you've ever played pool before, and they just bounce right off of each other. So finally, we come to the more modern version of the atom. And the new idea was that an atom consists of a nucleus located in the center of the atom. And this must contain a positive charge, um, which are the protons. But then also to make up for some of the mass, there are some neutrons in there as well. So protons and neutrons are really massive, which is what makes the nucleus so dense. Now, the other um, conclusion was that electrons must occupy a large empty space around the nucleus. All right, so we've got our atom. And then in the middle are protons, which are positively charged as well as some neutrons, which I'll just label N. And then um, that's our nucleus. Oop, my pen stopped working. Oh, there we go. And then there's also electrons, which I'll label E, that are just floating around the outside of the nucleus. So this is actually called the Bohr model of the atom. Now this is a really simplified uh, diagram of the atom, 
There are many other models that have been developed since this one, and they're much more complex, and we'll learn a little bit more about them later. But for now, all you have to know is there's a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons, and then there's an electron cloud around that. So now that we kind of know all of the different pieces of the atom, if we could zoom in on a sample of lithium, we would see lithium atoms, which again are the smallest piece of an element. Now within that atom, we would see a nucleus as well as some electrons. And then if we could zoom in on the nucleus, we would find protons and neutrons. And remember, protons are positively charged electrons are negatively charged. Now, one interesting thing is that protons, even though they're all positively charged and in the center of the nucleus, they aren't repelling each other. So this is actually due to something called the strong force. And that's kind of beyond what we're talking about in this class. But if you've ever wondered why protons can be in the same space together, it's just because of that extra force, um, the strong force. All right, so another thing to notice here, um, the diameter of an atom is about 10 to the negative 10th meters. That's really, really small. And then if we measure the diameter of a nucleus, it's even smaller, it's 10 to the negative 15th meters. So, one way I've heard this described that I really liked is imagine a baseball stadium. Let's say this is our stadium. So assume that the size of the baseball stadium is the size of an atom. The nucleus would be a little baseball sitting right in the middle of the stadium. So that's how small the nucleus is compared to the atom. All right. Now let's talk about the mass of the atom. So the mass of subatomic particles is really, really small. So chemists came up with a unit of mass that is also really, really small. So they call this the atomic mass unit, or AMU. So one thing to keep in mind is that protons have a mass equal to one AMU. Neutrons also have a mass of one AMU, and electrons essentially have a mass of approximately zero AMU. So electrons have very, very little mass. Now also remember protons and neutrons are in the middle of an atom, so that's where all the mass is that's in the nucleus. Now, the definition for atomic mass unit is kind of complex. Oops, whoa, I don't know what happened there. Uh, one AMU has a mass equal to 1 12th the mass of the carbon 12 atom. So carbon contains six protons and six neutrons. So if we add that together, we get 12. So scientists kind of arbitrarily chose carbon as our defining uh, element for mass. Um, hydrogen does have a mass of one. So some scientists were using hydrogen for a while, but then other scientists were using, um, I believe, oxygen. And eventually they agreed, we need to come up with you know, one definition for atomic mass unit. So let's just use carbon. So this was kind of, as far as I know, it was an arbitrary decision. Okay, 
Now again, electrons have such a small mass that they are not usually included in the mass of an atom. So in your textbook, there's a table that summarizes the masses and the symbols and the charges of each of the subatomic particles. So that should be table 4.5 if you have the current edition. All right, so protons we can symbolize with a P or a P plus, and it has a one plus charge, and its mass is about one atomic mass unit or AMU. And remember, protons are located in the nucleus. Neutrons are symbolized with an N or N zero, and they have zero charge, and their mass is about one AMU as well. And then they're also located in the nucleus. And then the electron is symbolized as E minus, and it has a negative one charge, and its mass is 0 0.00055 AMU, so often we just round that to zero. And electrons are located outside of the nucleus. And I'll post some flashcards for you under the study guide section of the modules so that you can um, kind of practice memorizing where each of these subatomic particles are located. And let's do a learning check. Which of the following subatomic particles fits each of the descriptions below? Protons, neutrons, or electrons? So let's do this one together. A, which subatomic particle is found outside the nucleus? The electron. Which subatomic particle has a positive charge? The proton. And which subatomic particle has mass but no charge? The neutron. Great. Okay. So next time we're going to go over atomic numbers and mass numbers for the elements. So this has to do with the number of protons that an atom contains. So I will see you in the next video.